Before we start, we're going to go ahead and do some introductions. My name is Catherine Hernandez. I'm the Development Services Administrator. I oversee the zoning and land entitlements team, and then part of that zoning group is the oversight of the neighborhood conservation districts. We currently have nine districts in the city, and so my team oversees the permit review and the inspections. Uh, with us, we do have our director, Mike Shannon, who's sitting in the back. We have our public, our public relations manager, Jimena Copa Wiggins. She's our, sitting in the back as well. And we have some staff members uh, who are here. We have Tyler Sorrells. He is part of our, one of our planners in our zoning team. He does the permit reviews and will be starting on inspections as well. Christy Flores, she's a planning manager. She also manages the NCD as well as the rezoning process. Mercedes Rivas, she's one of our plan planners on our uh, board of administration team. Zeke Solis, which you know, he is the uh, project planner for this project. He is the uh, coordinator over the NCD program that does the inspections and does the permit reviews. And then we have a couple of staff members outside, Marco Hinojosa, as well as Dominic Silva. And they're outside, they greeted you at the door. So uh, before we begin, uh, just gonna go over a little bit of housekeeping items. Uh, they are working on the AC, so hopefully it starts to cool off. If you, have, if you came in through the side door and you didn't sign in, the sign-in sheets are outside. We really would like for you to take a moment to sign in so that way we can get an accurate head count. Um, and now we're going to go over a few of the ground rules and a little bit about the process tonight. So uh, ground rules, participate, be respectful to others, be polite to the facilitators and to your fellow neighbors. Uh, speak in turn, make sure to listen to others as they're speaking as well. And we're going to keep focus on the topic in hand. We want to try to avoid long-winded speeches um, or uh, getting off on tangents. If someone has a specific question related to a specific piece of property, then we want to go ahead and take you aside at the end um, so that we can answer those questions. Right now we're trying to, do, uh, trying to focus on the, the revisions for the Neighborhood Conservation District. Um, if you have um, input uh, related to some of the changes, we want to be sure that you help us to clarify what you mean when you're recommending some alternative, uh, alternative suggestions to the NCD. And again, be as specific and concise as possible when you're speaking. So the way the process will work is I'm going to give a little background as to why we're here today. Um, and then talk a little bit about the process, how we got here with the proposed changes to the residential design standards. And then we'll cover all of the resident proposed changes to the residential design standards. So what I want to do is get through the whole PowerPoint. As we get to a slide that you have a question on, jot down that question. And then at the end, after I go over the next steps, then we'll come back and I can easily go back to the slides so we can go through those questions or comments that you have. So again, I'm going to ask that we go through the entire presentation, jot down your questions, and then we'll get you at the end. All right, so a little bit about the background related to our, the Mackey Park NCD. So as you, if you remember, if you were here when it was first created, it was created in 2008. Um, and at that time, uh, the city was seeing some significant revitalization. There was interest from different investments on developing in the neighborhood. Um, and so the NCD was created, and now we're seeing that uptick again with different types of development. So as we review those permits, as we review those type, new types of developments, we have identified that there are some flaws or some gaps in the NCD that we need to address, and that was the purpose of putting this, the task force together to review the NCD. So the CCR was done in March of 2017 by a former council member. And again, it was to form that task force, to form that group, to uh, be able to look at the, the current NCD standards, identify where those gaps are, try to address and come up with some creative solutions to address some of the different types of uh, development, and then bring that forward through the approval process. So a little bit about the NCD in case there's some new people that aren't sure what an NCD is. So again, an NCD is a neighborhood conservation district. It is an overlay district. Uh, that has design standards related to exterior features of your of your home. Um, sometimes there are NCDs that cover commercial projects. The Mackey Park NCD only covers residential projects, with the exception that if you are converting a residential structure into a commercial structure, then you do have to follow the NCD. So 
the purpose of an STD is to protect, conserve what those defining characters and features are of the neighborhood. So that way you don't have too out of place development uh, that is not consistent with the character. It promotes compatible infill development. Again, looking at the, the same types, not homogenous development, but the same types of features that would be carried through on a new development. Um, it has an administrative, fair, and objective, entirely objective review process. The NCD has standards that are black and white. You either meet them or you don't. If you don't, then there are options uh, to try to alter those standards by going through a Board of Adjustment variance process. Um, and again, it's a proactive tool for planning. So that's the purpose of an NCD. What an NCD doesn't do is it doesn't require property owners to rehab or renovate their properties, their existing structures, to conform to the new standards. So for example, if you had a cyclone fence in your front yard, the NCD that was adopted said that no cyclone fences are permitted in the NCD area. You get to keep your cyclone fence. You don't have to take it down. You don't have to construct a new one. You get to keep it. It's called non-conforming, sort of like the grandfathering, if you will. So it doesn't require you to conform to the new standards. The standards only apply when you are doing new construction or under renovating your home or adding new features to the property. Um, it doesn't enforce deed restrictions. If the neighborhood has uh, deed restrictions, the city does not enforce those deed restrictions. It does not change the base zoning of your property. Base zoning basically means how can you legally use your property. So for example, if you have residential zoning, that typically means that you can build a residential home on that. You have commercial zoning, that means that you can build a commercial use. There's different types of residential zoning, there's different types of commercial zoning but it doesn't dictate the use. The NCD is only about design, so the vertical construction going up, how it looks, not about how you use it. And the NCD does not prevent demolition. Historic overlay districts are the ones that have that demolition review process, but the NCD does not have a demolition review process. So the current NCD, again, it's a zoning overlay classification. Again, it's an overlay district, design standards. You still have your base district. Um, and as you can see, we have about nine. That's the different colored areas on the map. Uh, NCDs currently within the city. Again, addresses appropriateness of new construction and renovations. So the process that, was, that started back in October of 2017, once the CCR uh, was um, approved and move forward through uh, the process so so that we, we can form this process in order to bring forward uh, different design standards for review and approval by council. We started in October 2017 by putting together uh, a group of uh, neighborhood stakeholders. The stakeholders that were invited to participate in this process were property owners within the neighborhood conservation district. Um, and if you own property, you were sent out uh, an invitation to come to our kickoff meeting and at that point, we asked uh, for volunteers. In that meeting, we defined what the roles were uh, for the task force members because we were going to be meeting monthly, and there was going to be homework, and there was a lot of involvement that we needed from these people. So we needed, we needed people to be committed to this process. Uh, so we started off, we had volunteers, and we, and we started digging into the, into the details of the NCD, I want to say in January of 2018. So here we are a year later after meeting monthly and maybe a couple of other uh, meetings just to kind of wrap things up. So we had 13 task force meetings um, with this group. There were two uh, neighborhood association meetings in which we provided a status update. And now we have the one public meeting. That's the process. And then at the end, I'll talk about the next steps for the rest of the process. So again, the NCD is a zoning overlay district. So it is, uh, it is a section within what we call our Chapter 35 Unified Development Code. Uh, so it is uh, implemented and enforced through that. So it's zoning. So that means that any amendments to an NCD is considered a, a code amendment. So we have to go through the code amendment approval process. And again, I'll talk about that with the next steps. And again, the, uh, the design standards don't affect zoning. And this process doesn't expand the boundaries of the NCD or decrease the boundaries of the NCD. Yeah, NCD boundaries as they currently are and as adopted in 2008 still remain. All this process is doing is updating the standards within that NCD. 
So the task force reviewed all 15 design standards that are found in the that were adopted as part of the 2008 adoption of the NCE. Uh, they ranged from lot size uh, coverage, uh, front setbacks included, uh, to sidewalks, front walkways, fences, roofing materials, building materials, uh, garages, orientation of garages, carports, uh, building size massing, such as your uh, limitation on stories. Lying. There are 15 different standards that we all reviewed during these uh, 13 task force meetings. And within that, we identified changes to several. There were some that we considered minor changes, and there were some that we considered major changes. So first, I'm going to run through the minor changes. Uh, so we discussed all 15 sections. Uh, several of the standards that we reviewed received majority of support. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that process related to the majority of the support. So when we started this process, and what we've typically done with other NCDs that we've reviewed, such as Beacon Hill and Alta Vista, with that group we looked to gather consensus. Um, so if a discussion was, um, if, if a design standard started with a discussion, there was a discussion about maybe uh, making some alterations, we looked to see if we could gather a consensus. In uh, previous NCDs, the consensus was pretty much unanimous. Um, when we started this process for the first couple of meetings, um, it was more than a majority, if you will. Let's say that there were 10 members on the task force. We had nine in agreement on some of these minor changes. But as we went through the process and we started hitting some of the major um, standards that had some major changes, we had to alter that, um, that consensus process, and we started to have to take votes on that. Uh, because the consensus wasn't there, and the... Um, yays to a, to a change, no to a change, were too tight, so we, we started to take votes. Uh, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about that process as we start talking about the minor amendments. So with the minor amendments, most of them received majority support because we covered the minor amendments when we were looking to just gather consensus. So we made some alterations to the building height, parking, and dumpster screening. I want to go through these minor changes quickly because I want to touch on the major changes, but all of these changes are going to be in that spreadsheet that you picked up. So again, if you signed in at the front, there are some uh, handouts that were there. And there's a spreadsheet that, one of y'all want to hold it, hold it up, there's a spreadsheet that has a table of first column is what the current standards are, second column will illustrate the discussion that took place at the task force meetings, the third column uh, will illustrate what that new text language looks like if the uh, recommended changes are adopted by council. And the fourth column uh, represents our, the staff recommendation or staff analysis of those changes. Uh, so the building height, uh, I consider that a, a minor change. They made an alteration to the height limitation uh, going from two stories to allowing two and a half stories. So if, if you think about those dormer windows for some of the homes, it, this would allow you to have that. Um, and again, the base zoning for residential restricts you to two and a half stories, 35 feet anyway. So the 35 feet remains in effect now. Now it just gives you the ability to have that half story. Um, for the standards that were removed, the reason why we discussed the standards that were removed is that there are other parts of our code, our unified development code, that are already address these standards. Or some of these standards don't require a permit. If there's no permit uh, required, there's no review process. There's no review process. How are we to know that, and how are you to know that you have to meet certain criteria of the NCD? So it kind of set this, this cycle in motion of, of, of failure, if you will. You as a homeowner had no idea because there's no permit required. So you're putting in the, the new landscaping, didn't realize that maybe railroad ties weren't, weren't allowed, but that's what you utilize for your landscaping. Then we would get a call from the city uh, to the city to say, hey, someone uh, constructed and put new landscaping uh, uh, railroad ties there, and these are not allowed. So then we have to go out and do an inspection. So again, it was this, this, this vicious cycle, if you will, of uh, setting us up for, for failures. So that's why we discussed these things and talked about removing them. So for example, landscaping, unless you're building a structure, these don't require uh, permits. So we remove those standards. And that's not usually a unique defining feature uh, within a neighborhood conservation district. Because again, we're talking about construction. We're talking about exterior features. Sidewalks. Sidewalks are in the, in the city's public right of way. It has to meet city code anyway. So there is no need to, create, to continue to have standards uh, where uh, the city already had the standards in place for public right of way. 
Um, we modified the trash, the, the placement of uh, your waste containers, if you will, your garbage cans. The way the code is written right now is that it requires you to uh, screen or not have your trash cans outside in your front, in your front yard. Uh, and so there's no permit process, there's no inspection process for us to go out there and just say, hey, you need to move your trash cans behind your fence. Uh, so when we, as a task force, discussed what was the true intent of that, the true intent was to make sure that the dumpsters that are utilized for uh, large multi-family scale development were screened. And so that's the clarification that we made and removed the standards that um, didn't allow you to have your trash cans um, in your driveway or by your front, front of your house. Mailbox placement. We also removed that. U.S. Post Office is usually the one that dictates where they want the mail placed anyway, where they want those small structures. And so it was difficult for us to insert ourselves into a federal government process uh, to say, well, we want the mailboxes here. So we removed that standard. And then lighting wall packs. There's still lighting standards, but the lighting wall packs uh, were removed from that. And all those details are going to be in that spreadsheet. Um, some of the other things that we hope to clarify, which I would consider minor changes, are important because it allows you uh, to be able to maintain or repair certain items that were built prior to the NCD. So, such as driveways, front walkways, roofs, and fencing. So again, like I used the example earlier related to a cyclone fence, if you had a cyclone fence in your front yard before the NCD was adopted, it just means it's grandfathered in, it's non-conforming. But let's just say something happened and a piece of the uh, fence needs to be repaired or replaced. Uh, so we put in stand, uh, feet, I'm sorry, language in here that would allow you to repair or maintain that cyclone fencing so it wouldn't require you to tear down the whole cyclone fencing and put up different fencing. This would allow you to maintain that. Same thing with driveways. If you had uh, a driveway width uh, that is now considered non-conforming, a little larger than what new construction uh, is required to, to do, this allows you to repair or maintain uh, your current driveway width. Same thing with the placement of your front walkways. Uh, the NCD requires that a front walkway be a minimum of four feet away from a driveway. Let's say you were only three and a half feet you're still allowed to maintain and repair and replace that walkway in its current state. And then, of course, we talked about the fencing. So these are important, although considered minor, these are very important that would allow you to, to maintain and, and replace those, those features. So now we're going to cover the major changes. So some of the major changes that we tackled had to do with lot size. This is specifically going to address uh, some of the uh, new construction features that you're seeing with some of the homes that are built on smaller lots. The difficulty uh, that uh, an owner has is that they currently owned a 25 foot width lot and then they owned a half of another 25 foot width lot. Um, if you wanted to build a detached garage in a, in a, a single family structure on that lot, you would need to what we call be plat. Um, to replat, then you can replat it into a about a 35 foot uh, width lot. However, the NCD had a standard that said the minimum replat width is 50 feet, which meant that in order for you to do a 35 foot width lot, because that's all you own, you had to go to the Board of Adjustment for a variance. And that was that's an expensive process for a homeowner. It's $400, um, and it's a public input process. So. What happened is that instead of having to do that process, and it's a risky process because the Board of Adjustment is the final decision. Um, if you don't like the decision, then you can appeal that to district court. So it's, it's a gamble, it's a risk. And so rather than doing that, you just build on a 25 foot width lot, meet all of the NCD standards, because there are exemptions that are built in for these type of width lots. And then you don't have a detached garage. So we, we discussed that those, those features that were and, and the construction that was going on in the neighborhood to try to find and think outside the box is how do we encourage more of those detached garages uh, so that way your, your front garage is in your prevalent feature on the home. So we talked about we need to change the minimum lot width standards. So we talked about how for the 50 foot width lots we uh, discussed a boundary uh, that it would only apply to because many of those properties within this blue boundary were already 50 feet in width. So there wasn't a need to change the, the standards for those 
properties within that boundary. So that's why you see this underlined in blue, which is the new language that's proposed by the task force. So the 50-foot width would only apply to lots north of Parliament Place and west of New Broncos Avenue. That's one of the major changes. Um, the rest of it would be allowed to replat to 35-foot uh, width because many of these uh, properties within that boundary are 25-foot width lots. Some of them owned independently as a 25-foot width lot, but many of them are owned as a lot and a half of another lot. So, and then somebody else owns the other half of that lot and then the 25 foot width lot next to that. So this would allow the replat and encourage more of those detached garage features that are uh, one of the defining character, uh, characteristics of the neighborhood. Um, and then we also created a maximum lot width. When in 2000, 2008 when the NCD was created, the reason why lot width uh, was uh, one of the standards that uh, the task force at that time wanted to tackle was because they wanted to prevent the acquiring of lots, uh, buying them up, and creating what, what was then known as McMansions. Well, what was left out was a maximum replat width uh, because without that, someone could acquire all six of these lots, replat them all into one, and build a large structure. Uh, so the minimum of uh, the maximum lot width was discussed, and we uh, talked about doing a 75-foot width lot. It's the same thing that we do with Beacon Hill and Alta Vista. So another one that we talked about was uh, changing the variation for a front setback. Right now, the standard is that your front setback, if you're building new, um, can be within five feet of what's called the median setback of the developed lots on the, on the block face. So to acquire that median, if you remember from high school math, um, you, you take the measurement from all of the, from the property line to where the structure is, and then arrange them in such a way from least to, from the smallest to the biggest to find what your middle numbers are. That's your median. And from that point is where you had a plus or minus uh, flexibility to go either five feet more in front or five feet behind that median setback. And so that was the front setback for the NCD. The task force voted on changing that to eight feet, allowing three more feet for a total of eight going to the front and a total of eight feet going to the rear. We, as staff, assess that do not recommend that change. The reason why is because now you're changing it, which would create possibly a 16-foot variation across the block face. So for us, our perspective is that the five-foot gives enough flexibility uh, that was already being utilized uh, through new construction and was working. Uh, this is also a typical standard for other types of NCDs that have uh, front setbacks that are median and, uh, using a median in, in nature. So we didn't, staff doesn't recommend a change to that. Next one. Um, and then the other thing that we talked about is how do you measure that front setback? Um, so if you see from that drawing, this tells me that I'm measuring from the property line to the foremost uh, feature of uh, that structure. Well, the foremost feature of that structure from an aerial perspective could be your eave overhang. Um, and so this is something that we discussed when we did the Beacon Hill and Alta Vista NCD standards. So we wanted to create a consistent way in which um, the front setback would be measured because normally on... Um, on properties that don't have an NCD, your setback is measured from your property line uh, to the front, the, the wall of the front facade. So whether that's a post, if you have a, a porch, that's the post, that's the that's the structure that's holding up uh, your roof, or uh, the front wall of your uh, of your house. That's that's your setback. Here was giving too much variation in front setbacks because of the eave overhang. So we created language that would be consistent across the board for someone that wanted to. Uh, build and needed to tell us what that median front, front setback was. So you just take a consistent approach. If there's a if the property line is visible, or uh, or if you know what the property line is for the block, you can start your measurement there. Uh, if you if the curb is the consistent feature across uh, across the all of the block, you can use the the curb. It just makes it easier for you to measure. Or inside the sidewalk, if the if the block has a sidewalk for all of the lots on that block face. 
you can measure from the front, uh, from inside the sidewalk, as long as there is a consistent uh, way of measurement. Another major change uh, that was made was uh, talking was creating a standard as when you would apply that front median that median setback. So the task force talked about um, that the median setback would only apply when there are a minimum of five existing single family structures on the block face. Um, we don't recommend that change because now what you're doing is that you're, now you're looking at the use of the property, which could create variations on the block face based on that use. So as we know that there are blocks within Mackey Park that have a mixture of multifamily and single family homes. Uh, so this new requirement would exclude the multifamily structures, only include the single family structures, and then your, your, your medium is driven off of that. Uh, so again, we don't recommend that change, again, basing it on use, because, I mean, the black face is the black face. It's about the structure regardless of the use. It's supposed to be about that uniformity of the building line with slight variations. So that's why staff doesn't recommend that. Additionally, um, it may result in some incre increased costs to the homeowner in order to certify whether or not that's a single family home or a multifamily home. And that process would be you need to find CPS records to show is it a multifamily structure. You can go into BCAD to determine if, um, if that is a multifamily structure or a single family structure. So it's a, it's a bigger process for that homeowner to certify those, re those records and determine if it's a, a single family use or a multifamily use. And that's one of the things that we don't want to incur with the NCD is more cost to that homeowner. Another major change. Oh, I think, did I just go backwards? Sorry. Um, yes, okay. Uh, so another major change has to do with building size massing. For uh, First, we'll, we'll talk about the single family use or four or fewer units. Um, so right now, the requirement is that your structure can't exceed 50 feet in width. That's the entire width of your structure. We talked about how, what if somebody wanted to add some closet space on the side, you have plenty of uh, side yard, you're not gonna encroach on your side setback. What if somebody wanted to add a bathroom into the home, also on the side, you have plenty of side yard, you're not gonna encroach into your setback. We talked about how um, you could, with this new language, uh, expand that, go past the 50 feet in width, as long as you start 10 feet back from the front wall of your, of your structure. So you still have uh, that, that character uh, on the block face where uh, the, the massing, if you will, isn't wide when you're walking down the street. You still have the smaller 50-foot uh, width, and then you step back 10 feet, and then you can go. It gives you more flexibility when you're doing some renovations and construction on your home. Another change that was made related to the same type of, of structures is that as you know, uh, many of these properties were built uh, prior to a five-foot side, side road setback. Back then, uh, I want to say in the 65 code, we allowed uh, a three-foot side setback. And so many of the homes have a three-foot side setback, just a little closer to the property line. It's what, again, it, we use the word non-conforming. They're non-conforming. They're grandfathered in. Um, and they're allowed to maintain that three-foot side setback. But what was happening was that for any new construction adjacent to that lot, uh, that three, the three-foot non-conforming structure was sort of penalizing the, new, the owner that wanted to construct a new, a new home next to them uh, because it required a minimum width of uh, 10 feet for a single family. So if, that, if this home was three feet to the property line and you have to maintain a 10-foot separation between structures, you are now required to move your, your structure seven feet. So it equals seven plus three is 10. So it took away two feet that you were able to use for a side yard. So we talked about how if you are adjacent to a non-conforming structure, that you would be allowed to build as long as you maintained that minimum five-foot side setback. So again, this gives you some flexibility when building as long as you're meeting the minimum five-foot side setback. For multifamily structures, which are five units or more, um, there is a maximum width of 80 feet for these for these structures um, but the task force talked about that 80 foot width restriction would only apply uh, to properties located north of Parlin and west of New Braunfels so within that blue boundary that's where the 80 foot width restriction would would um, would result in outside of that you wouldn't have that 80 foot width of restriction 
you're still controlled by your lot size and your setbacks. The next thing that we also talked about was the same thing that we just talked about with the single family home. In this case, with multifamily structure, there is a requirement to be 20 feet apart. Uh, so if that structure was three feet, you were required to be 17 feet away. Uh, so this, this uh, standard that the task force talked about allows you to just build to the five foot side setback as well. Again, only if you have a non-conforming structure adjacent to you that's uh, less. Another feature, we, uh, another standard that we talked about for building size and massing for the multifamily structures is that um, if there was an existing multifamily structure uh, separated by an adjacent structure of less than 20 feet, that you would be allowed to replace with a new, a new multifamily structure um, and separate it from the adjacent structure utilizing the five foot side setback. So if there was uh, the foundation there, as long as you met the five foot side setback, you could rebuild. Uh, less than 20 feet. So that, that language was included in there to allow you to do that. Another major change that we talked about were uh, was related to garages, carports, accessory structures, and accessory dwelling units. Um, one, of the, one of these changes that the task force talked about was, as you know, the one of the defining character characteristics of the neighborhood is a detached garage. So the driveway that led to the rear, which is the detached garage, and here's your primary structure. Um, the current language had said that when a garage or carport entry faces the same direction as the home, so in this case, the home faces the street, the, garage, the detached garage faces the street, that the garage or carport be detached from the principal structure and located behind the principal building. The task force voted to remove that language and allow now uh, that the garage or carport could be behind the principal dwelling's forward-most architectural feature, which then results in this. So right here is what you would call your eave overhang. That is an architectural feature. So with that change, then now you would have a prominent feature of a garage because now all you have to do is show us that you're going to be one inch behind the overhang. Now your 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 this defining characteristic no longer exists with that the new language. So as a result, staff does not recommend that change because again, that's removing the defining characteristic of the neighborhood. Uh, another change was that for all other types of garages or carports that don't face the same direction, uh, that you could now with this change, as long as you started 20 feet back from the front wall of your structure, then you can start placing your, your garage. So whether it's perp perpendicular, still detached, as long as it was 20 feet behind. The current language had that it had to be 36 feet, no less than 36 feet. If the whole point of, uh, of encouraging detached garages in the rear, the further back you go, the better. So we revised that language to at least be uh, 20 feet behind the front wall. And that gives you flexibility as to the placement of the, of the garage as long as it's in the rear and 20 feet behind the front wall. Um, another, some clarifying language that we did as a result of the discussion related to the minimum lot widths is that, I talked a little bit about some of the exemption language that existed in the NCD because of the smaller width lots. Uh, so the current standard said that those, the requirement for a detached garage did not apply to lots that were equal to uh, or less than 110 feet in depth or 45 feet. Well, because of the proposed changes to allow replatting to occur at 35 feet, we then uh, made a, rec a task force made a recommendation of 35 feet. Uh, now, as we were putting this PowerPoint together, uh, one of the things that we want to be sure uh, to address is that it's not equal to, so we're probably going to make that change. It's about less than 35 feet that would have the exemption. So that way, if somebody were to replat, they replat at 35 feet, they would be required to have that detached garage. So we'll probably look to making sure that we clarify this by not having equal to, which still gives them that exemption. Um, and some more changes that were recommended uh, was related to portico shares. So this is an example of a portico share. It looks kind of like a carport, but it's a it's it's I, I would say more of a, a carport on, on steroids, if you will. Uh, so there's some clear, there's some language that was added in here 
about uh, where the roof pitch when it's attached to a single family structure, um, or where you can place it under a second story when attached to multifamily structures. We don't necessarily recommend those changes. This, this section was working without those changes. However, one of the changes that we find very important is that vertical support or structural elements of portico shares shall match the exterior materials of the primary structure. The current code allows us to, the flexibility of looking at scale, proportion, placement, and profile. The task force recommend removing that, which we think is now removing the flexibility because, for example, if your primary structure had asbestos siding, you would now be required to put asbestos siding on those forms and supports, and we don't do that anymore. So that forces you into a variance process. So that's why we don't recommend that. We recommend removing this language because having this language gives us that flexibility to, if it looks like it, if it uh, feels like it, then it, it would be that. So we don't recommend that change. So again, lastly, what I want to leave you with uh, before we talk about next steps is that Again, when the NCD was adopted, the NCD was adopted only for these properties within this red boundary. So the updates to the standards continue to apply only to these properties within this red boundary. So as you know, the, the Mankey Park Neighborhood Association boundaries are probably a little larger than that, but the NCD only applies to those properties. So the updates, if approved by council, would apply to these. And again, it only affects renovations and new construction. So I just want to be sure that you're aware of that um, moving forward. So our next steps in this process, again, we have our community meeting tonight. Uh, we have, part of the handouts you have is um, a, a paper where you can put in comments, um, questions, uh, input, uh, maybe uh, some of the uh, standards that you saw that need clarification. Um, if you don't want to, because we know that there are some people that don't like to speak out in public, so that's why we have uh, the uh, paper here and that we encourage you to use that. We're going to continue to collect those until February 1st. So it gives you the weekend to think about it up until uh, next Friday, I believe that is. And then after that, we're going to take that uh, information from all of the input that we receive, whether it's by email, whether it's that piece of paper that you can leave tonight or email to us um, after uh, until February 1st. And we'll assess that and, and we'll compile it, put it onto the website, and I'm going to show you where the website is uh, so that way you can see all of the uh, documents that we've gone through, the task force uh, progress through this process because it's a very transparent process. Um, and then uh, go from there over the next steps to determine if that is, there's a lot of uh, clarification that's needed or some um, questions that need to be answered. We'll determine if we need to have another community meeting. But assuming we don't need another community meeting, then the next steps of the process is, as I mentioned before, this is a code amendment, so it has to go to zoning commission. And our plan is to bring it forward to zoning commission in February for a recommendation. After that, it goes to council. Before that, it goes to a city council subcommittee, which is probably going to be our um, comprehensive planning committee. And then from there, it goes to city council for final approval or denial. Uh, so that's the next steps in the process. The website, this is a screenshot of the website. Um, if you go to... Uh, the uh, www.sanantonio.gov slash DSD. Once you're there, you're going to want to click, you're going to want to go to the left side of the margin, or left side of the page, and click on resources. Once you get to resources, um, then you're going to click on codes and ordinances, and from there, under zoning updates, is Mankey Park. This, uh, this website has the names of the, all those that served on the task force, um, it has all of the kickoff presentation materials that we have, all of the plats that we looked at, as well as uh, the documents that you see here, including that table. That's also available uh, for uh, your, uh, to download as well. We also did a briefing to the Neighborhood Association last week, and so that PowerPoint will be on there as well. And we will also load this PowerPoint uh, tomorrow onto the website uh, on that page as well, so you can have access to it. Uh, so to get there, then, www.sanantonio.gov slash DSD, go to Resources, Codes, and Ordinances, and then you'll find under Zoning Updates, Mankey Park. So again, before we start to take questions, I want to thank all those task force members. If you're here, would you please stand? Um, that way your neighbors can recognize. Thank you. Thank them for all their hard work over the last year. Um, we really scrubbed and talked and discussed about all the NCD standards, and so they did a great job 
uh, doing that over the last year. I've got to know them, so it's 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 been a pleasure. Um, so now we'll go ahead and entertain questions. We have a staff member that has a mic, uh, so that way everyone can hear the question, and um, and we'll keep we'll keep it flowing. Holly had her neck up first. Uh, thank you, uh, Ken. Could you just please clarify whether or not you'll be taking comments online or can you only give written comments on these sheets? We can take comments through email, on the sheets, however you feel more, more comfortable with it. We just ask that the deadline uh, for all comments to be received on is February 1st. And do we email them directly to you or specific? So uh, one of the handout, well, part of the uh, the materials that were out there on the table was also Zeke's card. So make sure to take Zeke's card because it has his email on there. Hello, I'm, I'm George Grimes. Uh, I wanted to give a little bit of background. I wanted to give a little bit of background on the uh, on the NCB. I I lived in the neighborhood for 44 years. I'm 415 Parlin, 1103 East Mulberry. I was on the original task force in 2008 that, that did the first NCB. I'm currently serving on uh, the task force that's updating the NCB. So uh, in, in 2008, we had a, a planning committee that consisted of 15 members. Of those members, six were architects and one was an engineer. So, And all of them were uh, property owners in the, the Nike Park neighborhood. So we had a good deal of expertise in uh, building and, and planning for neighborhoods. Uh, the first thing we did was we looked at the ordinance, and I want to read a little bit of the ordinance that allows the NCDs. The purpose of the Neighborhood Conservation District is to protect and strengthen desirable and unique physical characteristics, design characteristics, and recognized identity and charm to promote and provide for economic revitalization to promote uh, to correct and enhance the livability of the city, to reduce conflict and prevent lighting caused by incompatible and insensitive development, to stabilize property values, and to provide residents and property owners with a planning tool for future development. In order to do this, the zoning overlay district uh, provided for addressing certain design criteria, and it said. Uh, to be designated as neighborhood conservation district, the area must meet the following um, criteria. Maintain a minimum of one block face. Um, well, the, the design criteria that an NCD could um, address, it says it must include a minimum or note the inapplicability of the following elements. Building height, number of stories, building size and massing, principal elevation features, lot size coverage. Front and side yard setbacks, off street parking, load requirements, roof, line and pit, paving and hard gate covering. It also says it may include, but not, but doesn't have to include building orientation, zero site planning, density, floor area ratio, signage, architectural style and details, building materials, and so forth. So it, it allows for a great deal of uh, complexity in the design criteria. So the original committee, the first question we asked for were, what are the, the character-defining elements of the neighborhood, and are they the same, are they common in the, in the north and the south part of the neighborhood? And one of the things that committee did is, they went and they did a survey of every house in the neighborhood, house by house. They filled out a sheet. They, they had a list, checklist of the, the design uh, criteria, the character-defining elements of that. And, and we used that to establish the guidelines. And what we decided the character-defining guidelines were, basically, there was parking behind houses and no garage doors on, on the front of houses, driveways separated houses, creating more space between houses than the five-yard setback, sidewalks from the front crosswalk to the house entry, few front yard fences, few structures in the front yard setbacks, the main entry of houses faces the primary street, uh, the main entry is defined by a transition space, 
and there's a common pattern of front facade doors and windows. What the, the, the characteristics that we found were not common were exterior siding materials, roof slope, overhang material. And so what we ended up doing was we set guidelines that uh, step that, that reflected the most common character defining neighborhoods, uh, character defining uh, issues of the entire neighborhood, not just the north side, not just the south side. And so these are the guidelines uh, which, compared to what we could have established, are fairly minimal and, and in my opinion, uh, really established the character defining elements of. That, that, that's a little bit of background. And the reason we're doing this, by the way, is the Neighborhood Association um, asked for our NCD to be upgraded because of the different development patterns that occurred in the neighborhood over the last three or four years. Next question. Yes. Why were some of the most important uh, recommended changes limited to the area that was north of Harlan and west of the Broad Falls? Go back to that slide. Um, so for it, it's going to depend on the, the type of change. So let's go to one of the first ones. <coughs> talk about okay. Let's go. This one, I think, is the easiest one. So, um, as we talked about with the previous slide, is that for lot for, for changes to uh, replatting of your lot width, many of these properties within this boundary were already platted at 50 feet. So, a new standard to allow them to replat to 35 feet would make sense because then you would have this remaining portion of property that would be left nowhere. Uh, so it did make sense to uh, allow the change for a 35 foot width um, replat to those properties. So it kept the standard for these properties north because again they were a little they were platted differently than the remaining parts of the of the of the NCD. So these many of these within this area are already platted at 25 foot width lots. They've just been accumulated, if you will and built over the lot line uh, with a single family home or multifamily structure. So that's one of the reasons why. It was just that there's different features, different defining characters, uh, characteristics within these boundaries. That's why some of those standards were uh, recommended to be slightly altered for a northern area and a southern area. It's also zone different, you might mention that. That's true. Right now there is a uh, different zoning Many of the, the properties north of this blue line are single-family residential zoning, and many of the properties uh, south of that were multifamily residential zoning. Uh, so, which would allow you some more flexibility in building uh, more on, on the property. Pat, I tend to disagree with you when you say that a flat is a defining characteristic. The defining characteristics are what is there, and the houses that are there are not 25 foot houses except for those built very, very recently when a developer found out there were those size lots, uh, plats. But the platting, people built across the plats, the houses were larger, and those are what define this neighborhood. Thank you. Make sure to raise your hand high so as it comes. Good evening. Oh, good evening. Um, I, my name is Tony Westbridge. We own a couple properties on Funston Place. And though we're owner, our owners now, uh, this young lady uh, grew up in that house. It was built in 1940. So, so we've got a lot of best interest in the neighborhood. Uh, a couple of things that I'd like to get my on. A couple of things I'd like to introduce. Hello. You've got to stay real close to the okay. Is that better? No. no. Oh, got to be on this end. Okay. Uh, a couple things just that uh, the city can address. But if you've got to repair your house, and they've, they've already kind of alluded to it, but let's say your windows are bad. 
All right. Most of us have the, the old-fashioned wood windows, and to repair those old-fashioned wind, wood windows, first of all, are expensive. They're hard to do, and they're not the new, current, energy-efficient windows. So, so therefore, as I understand 3.3.1, which is on your building materials, there's some confusion. There's some confusion. Hello. Hello. There's, there's some confusion. Can I use energy efficient metal windows in lieu of the wood windows? Okay? And then I'll let Kat handle that one along with my two properties. We decided to put the reinforced uh, insulated uh, vinyl siding on our houses, which they, they look really nice and they look like the old clapboard, but we didn't have to sand it. And do all the clapboard work. Now, if, if I go to replace it, I can replace it or repair it. But if I do an add-on, then I question 3.3.1 if I'm getting the right deal. This thing's not working real well. Yeah, but then I tried that. And uh, one last question I'll throw out there. When we cut the side... You saw the demonstration when somebody's got a three-footer and they're allowed to put a five-footer next to it. Three-foot and five-foot's eight-foot. Do we have a fire code issue? I just wanted to address that. I, I always do that. Kurt? Yeah, I think it's a microphone. Currently, for any new construction, what you're looking at is a five-foot side setback for any construction. You have a lot of non-conforming structures around the city that may be less than five feet, three feet. You may even have King William where you have some right on property line. New construction will have to meet fire code at five feet. So there will only be a five-foot separation in those cases. Okay. Next. Well, answer my other question about materials. Three, three, one. Three, three, one. <coughs> Can I, can I use, do I have to put wood windows back in there? 331 is uh, strictly about building materials. Well, where else is windows? 3.4.3, uh, wall openings, fenestration. The sum of the surface area, and here we just talk about overall percentage uh, for windows. So um, in 3.4.6, uh, that's where it talks about windows uh, and the measurements. Because right now the the standard is that it, the for additions, renovations to existing structures, windows on the facade, uh, again, only the facade facing the primary street, uh, shall match the height to width dimension properties. For example, it's 2 to 1. Uh, the configuration is one over one like division and appearance, so recess trim and sale of existing windows. The replaced feet, replaced windows shall also match the existing windows in framing and material as found on existing or adjacent structures on the site. So the way the current entity is, is written is that if you have wood windows, it would be required to do wood windows on the front. Is that correct? Yes. Front. We're only worried about the front. Way back, Jonathan. So there's a question in the back first. Okay, thank you. Hello. Okay, forget it. Um, I'm just going to yell. All right, my name is Jonathan Fly. I'm a, a co trustee on uh, 114 116 uh, Andrews. And uh, I was on the trust uh, on the um, the task force, and I just want to report back to you. You know, there was a lot of conflict on the task force, and, uh, and much of that conflict never got resolved. And guys, I, I'm here to tell you this: this thing is not going to help diffuse conflict in your neighborhood. If anything, it's going to escalate it. Guys, this is going to be ammunition for your neighbor to complain about your house. Okay. Um, now, back in 2008, this group over here, up in the corner, wanted new urbanism 
and we discussed their theory. They wanted new urbanism for your neighborhood. Okay, that's a great thing. But here's the thing. In 2016, the city adopted new urbanism for the whole city in the UCD. So now you have new, new urbanism. Um, so I don't approve of this. I don't think you need it. I don't think it's going to help you. Um, my recommendation to you is to uh, raise these issues with the city um, and, and just identify this is not a document that's going to diffuse conflict. It's going to escalate conflict, and I don't think that's going to be a good thing for your neighborhood. That's my opinion. Thank you. Before we get to the next question, um, let me just kind of clarify. Right now we know that we already have the current neighborhood conservation district standards in place. If nothing is done, the current standards remain in place. They are not going to be removed. They are not going to be deleted. They will remain in place if nothing is done. So I just want to be sure that everyone understands that, that if nothing is done with these standards, the current standards remain. We're going to try to use the same microphone. I apologize. Richard. Hi, thank you everybody. My name is Richard Cross and I uh, own several properties here in Maiden Park. And I want to thank the city for doing their best efforts to try to bring everybody together and for the task force for trying to do the best that they can. But I'm forced to agree with my neighbor in the back of the room. Certainly, if there's a mechanism for changing the standards, there should be a mechanism for loosening the standards, uh, not just making them more restrictive and causing more conflict. Nothing I've heard today really addresses any of my concerns here as a property owner. It restricts my ability to build and to gain the maximum value of my properties. Uh, I find that Many of the areas in Mankey Park are zoned multifamily 33. But despite the city's insistence that they are not enforcing or changing zoning codes, by enforcing the NCD standards, they are in fact complicit to changing those zoning codes. If your zoning allows you to build four units on your property because of the parking, because of the driveways, because of various other factors, you are not allowed to build anything on that property other than a single family home. So you are, the city is, changing the zoning by enforcing the NCD standards. Nothing I've heard today really addresses my issues with multiple driveways on a multifamily home where the lot size is short and does not allow a rear parking structure. We must build parking in front of the house. Many places, new development have single parking in the front. Excuse me. Everybody has a chance to speak. So, how do you address a property owner that has a wide width lot that wants to put two structures attached to each other, but needs to have driveway and parking to maintain your NCD standards of one plus one in a garage. Nothing here that you've addressed does that. And I just feel that, you know, we're allowing a group of 10 people on a planning commission or whatever the task force to really make the city become enforcing a homeowners association. And that just should not be allowed. And again, I know that and I respect what you're trying to do, but you have to also respect the rights of property owners. Thank you. When did you move in? So just to kind of clarify, so the um, if if the standard is too restrictive, just like with any other property in the city of San Antonio uh, that has to comply with the Unified Development Code and may not be subject to an overlay district, if you want to do something that is a variation of that requirement or that standard, there is a process that you can utilize and uh, go to the Board of Adjustment Variance process uh, to request that that standard be uh, alleviated, if you will. That's the purpose of the Board of Adjustment. So um, it is a public input process, but it, it's not an automatic, no, you can't do it. There is a process and an avenue that you can utilize in order to request that that standard be relaxed, if you will, for your specific property. I'm sorry, I just want to follow that up. And I don't need the microphone. Basically, you said several, 
You've said several times during your initial presentation that the Board of Adjustment is no guarantee. The appealing to the district court is no guarantee. So we're here to discuss what you're trying to do to the NCP standards. And, you know, I think, let's take, I mean, I imagine there's 5,000 people that live in Lanky Park. Some old residents, some new residents, some multifamily owners, some single family owners, and you know, get a consensus more than just 10 people on a task force. And, you know, we don't want to go. We don't have the money and the wherewithal to go to Board of Adjustment and hope for the best. What we need to do is follow the code that's written, not so much what the staff at the city is trying to glean the intent. The current code says very clearly drive ways. Yet, my building plans were rejected because there was more than one driveway. Every other facet met the code 100%. The width of one center cut, one curb cut, I followed it. Branching off into two 12-foot driveways, the current code allows it. But because there's two front-facing garages, the city rejected it because the intent. No, that's not acceptable. What's acceptable is following the letter of the code. That's the only thing that's fair. So I just wanted to say board of adjustment is not an option for a lot of people. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. Uh, I'm Tony Shipley. And uh, what, what I'm hearing said is y'all aren't really enforcing it. It's what the neighborhood has come together to want to have these codes put in place so that we don't have multi garage doors facing the street. I mean, so I'm. Like confused with what you're saying because it's totally opposite of what the NCD has come up and proposed we do. So I don't I don't understand it. Well, the Mankey Park has always had. I mean, the code is to have the garages in the back. So all they're doing is it's not. I don't feel like it's the city enforcing it. It's what Mankey Park has wanted. Well, okay. So let me just kind of clarify that. So the city is enforcing the Neighborhood Conservation District standards because it is a zoning overlay. But the way that the NCD was originally created was it was over a year process in which, um, again, neighborhood stakeholders were asked to come together uh, as a result of an initiative that started with the, the council office. But it's not that once the standards were developed, the neighborhood association put them in place. It had to go through an approval process and it was adopted by council. It was adopted by your elected officials. And so that becomes the law, that becomes the rule. And so that's what the city is enforcing. It's not enforcing neighborhood association deed restrictions. It's not enforcing a, a desire, if you will, of a neighborhood association person on a board that wants things to look a certain way. It was a reviewed and approved and codified process that was approved by city council. So that's the rules that are in place. And, and, and you're right, there, there are some standards uh, of more restrictive than what the city code, a normal unified development code requires, but those standards are there because they were defining character features within the neighborhood that they wanted to conserve, similar to like a historic district. And um, there is some flexibility, if you will, uh, and that's what some of these standards are, are doing. Some of these changes are giving, uh, providing more flexibility for development. It may not address 100% of what you want to do on your property, but it is giving some flexibility uh, for some. But again, it is still to conserve those defining characteristic features. And that one of the defining characteristics is one driveway that leads to the rear of the lot for these homes. And you work within the rules or you can go to the Board of Adjustment. And you're right, it is a risky process and they are the final approval. But Board of Adjustment has approved variances within NCDs, within all NCDs. Um, based on the input, based on the project, once they get that input and you have done your homework and gotten the support of the Neighborhood Association too, that also helps. It, it's just, it, it's, it's going to be homework. It takes a little bit of work, but it's not a wall that you hit that you can't get around. So next question. Yes, ma'am. Um, I'm Polly Joel. Um, go ahead, Polly, go ahead. Um, and my husband and I are homeowners who live in Mankey Park. We specifically purchased our home in Mankey Park and we chose to we choose to live here because of the NCD. 
uh, and the protections against um, incompatible development and um, by um, certain types of developers who want to come in and destroy the beauty of this neighborhood. Um, and as Kat was saying, there are protections for people who made that in the board adjustment to, to request variances. Um, but um, I, I live here because of NCD. I don't want to be living next door to a McMansion. I don't want to be living next door to homes that have front-facing, um, front-loaded garages. And I've been very upset by the changes that have been happening to the neighborhood. Um, and, and I am glad that this process has been going on uh, to try and strengthen the NCD. Um, and I agree, there were problems with the composition of the NCD Review uh, Task Force. And the, and the composition in terms of the, the, um, the number of developers who are on the committee and task force as opposed to just regular homeowners and property owners within the neighborhood. I think there was, a, you went to the back of the room? Yeah, there's a question at the back. She's had her, she's had her hand up for a while. I just have a question, you know, I have a house and next to my house was uh, a man who put uh, a house there, he's an engineer, and he has five feet from his house to my house. And what he has done there, he has put uh, trees and every kind of plant, and he waters, he has water sprinklers, and that has caused damage to my house. The water goes underneath my house. And uh, likewise, he put a um, house to the very back of that big house. And he uh, put like a roof attached from the front all the way to the back of the house. And then he went and asked for permission from the city to be able to dig a hole underneath the sidewalk. And so what he did then, when it rains, all of the water goes through that hole, directly hits my garage, and has brought my garage down. So if you will, uh, it's very specific to your property. Well, if you can remain afterwards so we can get your name and address and then we can send Zeke out there to do an inspection to see what's going on with that. Thank you. Thank you. Down all those streets like Madeline, um, 
nuclear launch. And the builder admits that because of the existing rules, he didn't have flexibility to do anything but a skinny house. Now, so you can put rules on and ask for problems. Having all of this so-called protection, we didn't stop the uh, Broadway at Hildebrand and Broad, you know, Broadway. And I'm sorry it's shaking some of ladies' porch. But the money here is going to ruin you. I don't care what you say or what you think. They've let some developments in at the north of, you know, those, uh, I can't remember what streets, not Carnahan, but what, whatever. We've let the cat out of the bag. A horse is out of the barn. And now we're trying to put more rules on it. Personally, I'm upset because my tax dollars go into weatherproof windows that people get for free in other neighborhoods. But you can't because of the rules in this room. It needs to be consistent, people. This is America. And it's one right for everybody. Now, the Rio District. When did, when did they implement the Rio District to pass the Hilton Grand and Broadway building? So, as we need a new district, we get a new district. And your most important investment is your home. And you need to have some flexibility for what you do with it. That's your choice. And I'm just hoping that they could relax the rules somewhat, but we can't even compromise it. If the rule is eight on the UCD and we want five, or it's ten and five, I go, well, what about eight? Oh, no, it's got to stay five. So there's no flexibility. And I'm like, this gentleman said, you can't afford to go to the, you know, these commissions. So just keep that in mind. And another thing that's never addressed, I own a multifamily. When I, my grandmother bought it, everybody had one car. Yeah, everybody has two cars. So you automatically have a parking problem. And now they're going to want to outlaw parking on the street during certain hours. I didn't hear that. We did that. We it in. Um, we've got to think ahead. And we think about this far ahead of where we're going. We're not seeing the forest for the tree. Rules need to be for everybody. They need to be fair. They need to be flexible. And first of all, they need to respect property rights. Thank you. Corey? My question is about the process. Now, obviously, we have different opinions in this room, and they're very different. What is the process going forward? I, I'm not sure I really understand that. So, as we said, um, all comments, whether through email or um, if you want to email that piece of paper, we will take up until February 1st. We'll assess those comments to see if it warrants a, a more input. So, for example, let me give you an example. When we were at Beacon Hill, uh, when we did the first community meeting, uh, there was a lot of questions and comments related to some of the restrictions that were still um, within the current Beacon Hill MCD. So we took that feedback back, we uh, went back to the task force and discussed them and, and said that, okay, we need another community meeting because if there is a general consensus from the community that they want to allow some cyclone fences in the rear yard, why not have that discussion and, um, and determine if the consensus is to allow cyclone fencing in the rear yard. So again, that's, the, that's an example of what we would do. We would assess it, determine if we need to reconvene the task force and or just go to another community meeting to talk about the input and maybe some recommended changes. If we don't have uh, any uh, issues that uh, need to reconvene the task force or community meeting, it's just input and assessment. We'll load that onto the website, I'll log it all in, report it onto the website so everyone can see what that feedback is, and then move on with the process. Yeah, I got a follow-up there. I apologize. So when this goes to the zoning commission, does it have staff recommendations on it in the document, and the zoning commission decides what to choose, or does the staff recommendations go up as this is what we recommend? So when it's presented to zoning commission, zoning commission is a recommending body. A zoning commission can either make a recommendation, and, and the way it's going to be presented is that staff will present what the task force put forward, Staff will present the recommendation that we, uh, our analysis and, and assessment, uh, because uh, the Neighborhood Association was involved, well, they'll probably provide us with a letter indicating whether or not that they support the, the task force uh, proposed revisions, staff's recommendation, or if they have um, alternate type of recommendations that they want to put forward. 
Zoning Commission will consider all of it. Zoning Commission can make a recommendation to adopt the task force recommendations. They can make a recommendation to adopt staff's recommendations. They can make some, some tweaks, some alterations to it, or they can re recommend no changes at all and keep the current NCB in place. But again, they are just a recommending body, and then it goes forward through the, uh, to the City Council, because City Council has a final decision on uh, the proposed changes. Yes, ma'am. I have a question about the recommendation. You pretty well answered what my original question was. Thanks for that. But when, how often in the course of these NCD recommendations from the staff has the, um, oh gosh, our, the second group, the, the zoning part. Zoning commission? Right. How often do they change or not go, okay, how often do they not go along with staff recommendations? Because there's some specific things that the, that the committee wanted or voted on. Again, we were very divided on them, and then, you know, voted, etc. But staff's recommendation is different from what the committee had voted on. So my question, I guess, is be more succinct. How often do they ever go against staff's recommendation? When it comes to code amendments, it's a little different than zoning cases. Uh, so zoning cases, they could uh, they could not go with staff's recommendation, and it happens. But with uh, code amendments, whether it's an NCD, whether it's our typical code amendment process, zoning commission has made altered uh, alternative uh, recommendations before, um, and um, and some of them they've agreed with staff's recommendation or or proposed an alternative based on feedback that they got at the public hearing. It just depends. Um, I, I can't put a percentage on how often, but in, in my experience with development services, I have seen them come up with a different recommendation than what staff put forward. Okay, not on everything, but maybe on some things. Thank you. Good. Hi, my name is Sandy Burge. I live on Ira Avenue. I'm not in the bungalow district, by the way, and I live in a bungalow. So what, I, what I'm hearing, what I'm hearing, a difference of opinion has to do with people who own property for investment purposes compared to people who own property because they want to live in the house. <laughs> My observation on Ira Avenue, south of the park, Ira Avenue, for those of you who are really unfamiliar with the south part of the neighborhood, is one block north of Mulberry. It is a mix of uh, single family and a mix of small uh, apartment buildings, somewhere between uh, three to eight different units in the multiple family. And all of them have Setbacks, they all have driveways that go to the back, they have parking in the back. All of them, all the properties have um, behind the behind the building parking. There are three exceptions on four blocks worth of street to that. One has a garage in the front, one has parking in the front, and there is an apartment complex with the, the face is carports, so you don't really know where to enter the apartment itself. So I just want to make that observation that it's possible to have these kinds of guidelines in the section of the neighborhood that is mixed single family and multiple family housing. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, yeah. Is there a woman in the gray shirt? Right here? Yes, yeah, sorry. Okay. Um, I have a couple of our questions. Uh, one of them is for Kat. Is Funston in that 25-foot plat area, the antiquated plat? Yeah. And while you, while you look at that, yes, it is. So, Funston is 25. Okay. And actually, it's not, not so it's Par not Parland is the dividing line. Yeah. South of Parland is 25. Funston is actually at 50. Funston, South of Parland. Funston, Funston, is, Funston is south of Parland. And everything, I thought that when we first saw that 1923 plat. I mean, not Parland. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm concerned about the, the parts of the neighborhood being treated differently. 
And the reason I'm thinking about this 25-foot antiquated plaque, why would Funston be excluded from 3.1.1 and from several of these other things? The division is north of Parliament. Over and over again, it's north of Parliament, where I believe there are parts of the neighborhood that are pretty much identical to the north of Parliament, um, like where Sandy lives. Um, and there are areas um, on any street, I, I just don't see this huge division in the neighborhood. We've always been a neighborhood. We were never the North Siders. Uh, and, uh, and and I don't, I really question some of these changes specifically as they relate to Funston, unless it is on that 25 foot antiquated plat. But I don't remember it as being on that. I thought that that thing ended around Claremont. So, just to give some perspective on um, whether or not it is uh, appropriate to create different standards for different parts of the neighborhood. There are NCDs uh, that we currently have that, within their standards, recognize that there were different features, different size lots, different setbacks um, that were without, throughout the neighborhood. And rather than creating one uniform standard for the whole area, they created different standards to recognize those defining features, if you will. Um, so. It is possible that other NCDs that currently have uh, one way, one size fits all, uh, to create standards that recognize the differences. It doesn't mean it's dividing the neighborhood. It's just, in, in our perspective, in, in the staff perspective, because there are other NCDs that do this, it's just recognizing that there are differences and um, allowing the standards to continue with those differences. But it, it's not creating a different district. It's not creating a north side versus south side. It's just recognizing that things are a little different based on lot layout, so therefore maybe the standards should be configured a little differently based on that lot layout. Now, in answer to your question, I think what Zeke was saying is that those are 50 foot. Again, that was just the discussion from the neighborhood, if the, uh, from the task force, I should say. If within this process and, during, and with the comments and feedback that we get back, if, if further defining that boundary line, narrowing it, it is, is wise in order to conserve, continue to conserve those uh, larger lots, then maybe that's something that we need to do and maybe that's something that we would recommend to the Zoning Commission. But these aren't, these aren't, def, these aren't set in stone. This is just the first step in, in recognizing that there are some differences within the neighborhood. I do have all of the plats on the website. If you want to take a look at those plats? Um, some as early as 1890. Back then, Pinckney did cross over all the way to Broadway. Back then, it was River Road. Uh, so it did cross over. Everything south of Pinckney was 25. Everything north was at 50. Who's next? I'd like, I'd like to, make to answer your question, Funston is MF 33 and south. Everything north of Funston, Parlin and up, is, is zoning at, at, at R4. So that's one thing. That's the current zoning, correct. That's current zoning. And I just had a real quick question on the going forward. There's a subcommittee meeting, um, council subcommittee, if you go to that very last slide. Yes. Is that available for public uh, so the council subcommittees, uh, the council has different subcommittees to talk about different functions. Like, for example, uh, if you were uh, listening to the news this week, there was a transportation committee that talked about the uh, scooters. Uh, and so the council subcommittees are committees made up of about four council members to go into a little bit more detail on certain policies before they move forward to city council. So the council subcommittee in this case would be the uh, comprehensive plan committee. It is um, open to the public, uh, and most of them do have a citizens to be heard um, sign-in sheet. I believe all of them might now. And so they have the ability uh, to allow citizens to speak, and then they'll have the presentation by staff. How do we find the schedule for those? Uh, so once we know what date we're going, we're going to put that on the website, so that way you'll see. Do you want to go to Mary? Go, I think Mary okay. Yeah, I was uh, an alternate on the task committee, so uh, I've listened to all this and sort of sat back and watched what's going on. Um, but one of the things about the, the lovely part about that we had a park, it's called Manhattan Park, 
And it's that wonderful green stick, you know, with the, with the last standing mesquite forest. And I feel like the homes that surround us should be, should be and have equal, you know, importance. So the south side, as far as Punston goes, should not be any less, you know, lovely as, as the north side. And both sides have multi-family. So you can't say that Harlem doesn't, you know. I don't, I don't understand why this is discrepancy. I know we talked about this in, in the task force, and I brought this up in. Why, especially since they're 50 foot lots, they're not 25, why is the border, the south border, Funston, as opposed to Parliament? Because the whole we talked about having and enjoying these two streets as part of the, one of the first homes that were built in Indy Park. But we didn't like to show homes. I mean, if you went and did something like this at King William, it's in you know, their circle, their surrounding. You have the north side of it and the south side, and the homes are completely different and treated differently. Then, then I, I, I feel our park is sort of the same way that the north and south, constantly the problem. Anyway. Thank you. Uh, I'm a resident and a property owner, obviously, in Yankee Park, and have been for many years. And I'm glad that you brought up the subject of scooters. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Can we just keep okay. it to the NCD? We only you're, have you're, maybe about 20 minutes, and then we're going to have to wrap up. I, I understand. Let me tie this together. There was a piece in yesterday's paper talking about the need to regulate the, the scooters, and one of the councilmen pointed out that he was for regulation, but not to the point that it hurt people's ability to make a profit. Uh, he and I must have gone to different civics classes in high school because my understanding is that the American way is that you have the opportunity and the ability to seek a profit, but there's no requirement that you have to make a profit. And because of that, it seems to me that um, there needs to be a balance between uh, property rights and property opportunities and what happens to your next door neighbors. To me, this is not a question of liberal versus conservative or capitalism versus socialism or anything like that. It's looking at the greater good for the greater number and taking the long-term view of what's going to happen to our neighborhoods. Uh, there are some proposals that could really be beneficial to a property owner next to me could be quite detrimental to mine, which I think is the whole point of trying to keep some kind of neighborhood integrity. And whatever recommendations ultimately come out of this process, I hope that neighborhood integrity for everyone is kept foremost. Thank you. Uh, can I have hand up for questions? Oh, the woman in the green shirt, that's right. She had this. Hold it up closer. One of the things that uh, I found that we've kind of struggled with with the NCB process is the concept of setback. Uh, the early version said plus or minus five feet from the median, and it's been up to the property owner to go out and determine that, the staff to determine that. Uh, I would like us going forward just to go ahead and establish a median for each street, recognizing it does vary block by block by block by block. Record that median put it on the paper, it's easy for the developer to understand, it speeds it up for the developer, and it's easy for staff to administer. Um, and then secondly, uh, the other thing I want to mention in regards to the NCD, recognize that the vast majority of the things that we are discussing tonight, if it wasn't for an NCD, would be covered by some sort of city code. And if we didn't have the NCD in place, who knows really what we'd be getting. And so, the NCD was done originally with the spirit and the intent that the, the, the reason that we all bought into the neighborhood, the beauty, the vision, live on. And we want that, to, 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 those characteristic defining features to continue for our future generations. And so I think we've done a pretty good job because obviously the developers have found this and they thought, hey, looks pretty good. I want to develop here. So to me, the NCD is working, uh, the hard work and effort that a lot of people who lived in the neighborhood for the last 20, 30 years. Is paying off, and so uh, they all do. Thank you. Hi, 
Uh, my name is Reese. I've lived in the neighborhood for 28 years or so. Um, George, George, can you remind me how many people were on the original NCD? Uh, 50? 15. 15. 15. Uh, it's a lot. Um, I was bothered by the fact that with this new uh, group that was working on it, was picked exclusively from people who could attend a meeting in the middle of the day on a work day at 3 o'clock. And that's that's all the people that were chosen for this, or that's where the group of body of this group was chosen from. Um, and it, it, and, but all the future meetings, all those meetings after that were held during the work day. And if I recall correctly, on a Thursday when I couldn't, because not only do I have a job, but I have a kid who has to be transported to school. So I did find that disturbing because I don't, didn't really feel like it got a very wide range of people who could participate. But my question really is really silly. It's about sidewalks because you guys pulled out something about the side, a lot of information about sidewalks. And if I recall correctly, when we were having some sidewalks replaced in the neighborhood, they did have to look at the NCD and make sure that the sidewalks aligned with all the neighboring sidewalks. And they were and and you guys have taken that language out, and I'm unclear why. It's actually not an NCD requirement. That's actually required by code. I mean, you don't want to build a sidewalk that leads to nowhere. If, there, if the adjoining uh, lots already have a sidewalk, then uh, the city will connect the two. Again, that's public right away. So it's okay. not an NCD requirement. So it would have been required either way. Yes. So because I recall when, well, the, the, I don't remember if that was what the city was planning or, or what was, but that's good to know. And to address the task force question, so um, they, task force members weren't chosen. We uh, asked for volunteers. Um, again, we gave them the parameters of uh, when uh, staff could meet, and we did allow the uh, committee or the task force members to meet on their own in the evenings as well. Um, so that way they can continue to work on their homework. But when we first started after the kickoff meeting, we had a lot of volunteers. We asked for both primary and alternate um, uh, members, if you will, so that way if the primary person couldn't attend, the alternate could attend in their place, and there was always a seat at that table for that person. Uh, we then opened it up by inviting uh, the original members of the Mackey Park uh, Committee uh, to also be part of that process, because some of them didn't go to the kickoff meeting. So the task force was evenly represented by both, uh, as Polly said, those that had, oh, again, all of them were property owners because for us, they're all treated the same. And everyone is always going to be have an investment in the property, whether you live there or you don't. It is still an investment. So we uh, had both those that didn't live in the neighborhood but were property owners and those that lived in the neighborhood and property owners, and those were evenly distributed. It all depended on attendance. But again, we told those that couldn't attend, primary members, to have an alternate come in their place. And so that way, again, the, table, the, the seat at the table was maintained. Not everyone could attend every single meeting. We met once a month uh, until the very end when we uh, picked up a couple of meetings. Uh, so it was always going to depend on attendance. And so that's how we ended up with some votes going certain ways depending upon that attendance at the meeting. So, but again, it was evenly distributed. Uh, Boy Chase, uh, I'm, I was on the committee and I've been an officer, uh, whatever. But I, we've heard some discussion about uh, driveways and I don't think it's as clear as it should be. So I'm going to make a suggestion that if you go over to 2.5.1, 2 move all of that down there. I want to keep what it does say right now, but add one suggestion. And that would be that new residential dwellings must have a driveway that leads to the rear of the property, period. That clarifies it and puts it in writing. And that way it can be uh, read by those that are going to build a new home, there has to be a driveway. And to answer the question about committee meetings, go to Legistar for the city of San Antonio and you will see all of the city meetings when they're coming up and the agendas are publicly put there all the time and backup documents. 
whatever document holds to the item being considered. That's Legistar for San Antonio. Sorry, it's me again. Just want to make a comment to his comment. If you have a 25 foot lot and your minimum side setbacks are 5 feet, and a driveway has to be 10 feet, that leaves you a buildable footprint of 10 feet wide. So it's not really practical to have that change. So it's the 25 foot width lots are exempt from that driveway? Yes, yes. So he wants to make it so that it's for all the properties. I want to make it very clear. No one wants to destroy the neighborhood. God bless all the people that have been living here for 30 or 40 years, and I know they want to keep everything the same. But my other question is regarding the 35 foot minimum plat requirement. I wondered why the city recommends that when the original plat book from the early 1900s and the late 1800s, the NCBs, show very clear lot sizes of 34 feet in width, by 85 feet in length. An 85 foot length will not allow a back drive. It just won't. With a 20 foot front and a 20 foot back setback that's required, you cannot put in a rear driveway. If there's a way, love to do it, but we just can't. And you're correct, and that's why staff would recommend that uh, the exemptions remain as is for those so we don't create unbuildable issues, if you will. Uh, and so uh, the 110 depth, if you're less than that, you're still exempt from that requirement that the detached garage be there. And then again, what we're going to do is uh, take out equal to to be less than 35 feet. So those that are 34 feet, 34 feet in width uh, would also be exempt from that detached garage driving leading to the rear uh, requirement. Okay, so Scott, they were, I was on the committee also, and uh, my, my wife and I are property owners, and we live on the Claremont, on Claremont in one of the uh, skinny houses with the front loaded garages. And, uh, <laughs> We, we love it. And uh, I have to say, we we were driving around in Yankee Park for probably four or five years. Uh, we, we used to live out in the suburbs, and we were downsizing. We were looking for a place to move into town. We were tired of living out there for a lot of reasons, and uh, for a lot of reasons we couldn't we couldn't move downtown. Uh, we were driving around one day, and we just were driving up down one day and we saw these little skinny houses and we thought, oh, this looks pretty cute. You know, so we drove another block or two, oh, there's a sales office. Let's go in and talk to them. You know, three days later we had a contract on the place. And, uh, and so it was fine. We liked it. We love it. And uh, we think it's a nice, lovely little modern, you know, modern urban house. We love it. We like the old houses too. We always have like and it's like, it's a good mix. So I don't understand the, and I never have understood, you know, all this enmity that we, we, we've seen. I see it on Facebook. Nobody ignores Facebook. I'm, I'm not smart enough to. Uh, and then we see on Facebook, and then all this, and then, and then, you know, about all these new houses and stuff. But I mean, it's just a lot of, I don't understand it. And it just doesn't make any sense. There was a comment earlier about the, we, it stated that the, the builder's goal, the developer's goal, was to destroy the neighborhood. Well, that's ridiculous. The goal, of the, the builder's goal, is to make money. You know, maximize revenue and minimize cost. And the way you minimize cost is one of the things you do is to, you know, know what the codes you're developing, you're developing to are, meet those codes. And minimize the number of variances that you have to do, have to ask for, and on, you know, on and on and on. And so I think the developer's done pretty well. I think if we could just be decent neighbors with each other and you know stay off of, you know, just you know, treat each other well, our houses are what they are, the old houses are what they are. And that's fine, it's a good neighborhood, and, and that's fine. And I also will uh, second his idea that the, the uh, all driveways going to the back aren't going to work in the 25 foot lots, obviously. Thank you. Any other last questions? 
All right, so um, my cards are up front. If anybody wants to email me questions or comments, feel free. We've also got additional sheets up front if you want to leave your comments. I've got a box up front, so you can leave them there as well. Uh, we are taking comments till February 1st. Uh, so let me know. We're going to load everything tomorrow as far as PowerPoint, so you have access to that as well. Thank you, everybody, for attending tonight. We really appreciate your input.